I'm a mother, standing in the need of prayer. I'm a mother, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, stand in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, stand in the need of prayer. Stand in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord. Stand in the need of prayer. And as was mentioned in the uh, call to worship, we are continuing in our 175th anniversary celebrations here at First Congregational Church uh, in Melrose, United Church of Christ. And uh, we have a special guest with us uh, this morning, uh, United States Congresswoman Catherine Clark, uh, who has a history here at our church. We fully consider her a full uh, member of our church family here. And uh, she will be joining us after the worship service today, right here in the sanctuary. We're going to begin right after the post um for a conversation about faith and its place in our lives and in the world today. And uh, then we'll have our coffee hour out in the uh, narthex with cake. We're going to have cake for that. Um, so if you came for nothing else, there's going to be cake. Um, so that's after the service, uh, and then you're going to have time to greet her and, and, uh, and uh, share some pictures if you'd like and that sort of thing. Um, but right now, uh, I'd like to invite her forward to, to bring greetings uh, to us uh, on our 175th. So welcome. So glad you're here. Right on. Thank you so much. It is really wonderful to be home in this church. And I thank you for welcoming me on this incredible occasion. Over the years, this congregation has meant so much to me and to my family. And I feel this church stands as a beacon of altruism and empathy. And thinking about today's service, I thought about the words of St. Paul and his appeal to be kind to one another, tender-hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. This community honors our obligation to not only profess ourselves Christian, but to be Christ-like in our actions, to open our doors to all our neighbors and to affirm their equal wealth, worth and wealth. That would be good too. <laughs> Amid so much division at home and suffering abroad, that love of humanity has never been more important. And the longevity of a congregation like this gives me hope for the future. Hope that our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will carry the same compassion of this congregation in their hearts. So on behalf of the United States House of Representatives. It is my privilege to present you with this congressional citation and American flag that was flown over the Capitol in your honor. And in recognition of this congregation's 175 years of loving, dutiful service. And with gratitude for the light you bring to every person who is touched by this congregation and this church. Thank you so much.
guys are here today. Thanks for coming. Hi. It's okay. I got a question for you. Here's a question for you today. Oh, got one more coming up. Yay. It's a, I want to say unicorn? Okay. Here's my question for you today. What do you want to be when you grow up? A, really? A landscaper. Okay. That's cool. That's a really great idea. You got one? Yeah, what? A sports, player. a sports player. Okay. And. <laughs> no, no. You're, I'm sorry. You don't have to say anything. You got any idea? Okay. It's okay to not know. It's okay to not know. It's trying to figure it out. But. I'm not hearing pastor coming through here. It's kind of cool. Right? Give it some thought. Give it some thought. Here's the thing. No matter what you end up doing in life, I hope you know this. And I've said this before, and I hope at some point it sinks in. Who you are is always more important than what you do. Who you are is always more important than what you do. And who you are is a child of God, and you are loved. You're a child of God, and you're loved. That's important to remember no matter what you end up doing, because like when I was a kid, what I wanted to do when I grew up, grew up was to be an airline pilot. I thought that was the greatest thing imaginable. You're just flying a plane around the world all the time. That'd be so cool, until I figured out I was afraid of heights, and that <laughs> didn't work out so well, so kind of took a different path. But, but let's say I was an airline pilot. There are some airline pilots who go to work every day and they're grumpy and they're angry and they're complaining about everything and they know nobody wants to be around them. And then there's other airline pilots who go to work and they're friendly and they're encouraging and uh, they're positive about things and people like being around them. Both are airline pilots, right? But they're different kinds of people. So who you are is always uh, more important than what you do. You want to be a pilot of an airplane now? Okay. 
You can still be the landscaper too if you want, because that, that, you know, do one and then the other. People do that, you know, they do more than one thing as they grow, go through life. Uh, but that's one of the reasons we come to church, probably the reason we come to church is to remember those things, that we're children of God and that we're loved. And if we remember that, if we really bring that into our hearts and we live from that, no matter what we do in this world, it's going to be good. And we're going to bring goodness not only to ourselves and the people around us, but we're going to help build a better world. And I think people who go into their jobs and they're grumpy and they're angry and they're complaining all the time are people who've forgotten that they are children of God and that they're loved. So we need to remember that. We need to remember that because it makes a difference for ourselves, it makes a difference for the people around us, and it makes a difference for this world to become a better place. That's God's calling for us. So remember that. You're a child of God and you're loved. And who you are, that's who you are, and it's always more important than what you end up doing. All right? All right. Thanks for coming up. You can go to your classes. And I invite you to hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. When he, meaning Jesus, when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the Pharisees came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And the Pharisees argued with one another. Well, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first son and said, son, go work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same thing. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came in to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Here ends our scripture lessons for this morning. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these holy words. And will you pray with me? Compassionate Creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, ah, yes, the Pharisees, the perennial villains of the New Testament. Were there any good Pharisees? Well, of course there were good Pharisees. We just don't hear about them in the Bible or in the New Testament. But they were there. There's a broad group of people the Pharisees were, but it's really not so much who the Pharisees were, but who they've come to represent. And an important thing to remember here with these, these debates, these arguments, this conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees is that this is an in-house argument that they're having. Right? Because they're all Jewish. Jesus is Jewish, Pharisees are Jewish, chief priests, the scribes, they're all Jewish. And they're, they're debating, they're arguing about their faith and the nature of God for them. But one thing's for sure, the Pharisees were accustomed to being listened to. Why? Because they were the religious authorities, they were the teachers of the day. But then, along came this new teacher, Jesus. And people started listening to him maybe a little more than they were comfortable with. And that was threatening to them. It was threatening to their authority. The Pharisees were alarmed. They feared Jesus' popularity. And on top of that, he seemed to have the ability to heal people and to perform miracles. 
So what did they do? Well, instead of listening to what Jesus had to offer, they went on the attack. They said he was preaching heresy and leading people astray, leading people away from religious tradition. They said that Jesus was, as we might say today, propagating fake news. Right? He, Pharisees went on a campaign to expose him as a fraud. That's the context. That's the context for Jesus' story about the father and these two sons. It's a great little story, really. Father had two sons and said to the first son, go out and work in a vineyard today. And the son immediately says, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Today we might say, he might say something like, "Mm, I I got a new video game and that's, I'm not going to do that. And he could probably afford a new video game because his father owned a vineyard, right? But later he thinks to himself, well, that was pretty awful of me. And he goes off and he works in the vineyard. Meanwhile, the father goes to the second son, says the same thing, go work in the vineyard. And that son says, absolutely, I'm all over that. The father leaves and the son kicks back, puts his headphones on, goes nowhere. Then Jesus asked this simple question, really. Which of these two did what the father wanted? And the Pharisees say, the first, because that's so obvious. And then Jesus delivers this punchline. I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not change your mind and believe in him. That's really a punchline, and it's the Pharisees who are the ones that got punched on that. And I imagine Jesus heard some some gasps from the crowd that day, like, oh, how dare he? Because it was unthinkable to compare the righteous Pharisees to blatant sinners like tax collectors and prostitutes. Didn't he know? Didn't Jesus know that the Pharisees were too good to be lumped in together with the likes of them? Didn't he know that of all people, the Pharisees were the ones who had the right credentials so to speak, to make it into the kingdom of God. What was Jesus talking about? Why was he excoriating the best people in town? This passage packs a powerful message, not just for the Pharisees, but for all of us as well. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's he's splashing hot pink paint over a black and white picture, a black and white world. He's tearing open the windows of a darkened room and letting the sun blaze through. He's showing people a whole new view of God that breaks down the boundaries of everything they thought to be true. I mean, Jesus is talking about what types of people are acceptable to stand before a holy, holy God, and he passes right over the religious professionals in favor of the worst sinners. Has he lost his mind? Or, or, could it be, could it be that judging people who made mistakes or who have led hard lives earns zero points with God? Could it be that even those of us who consider ourselves righteous or people of faith, we can lose our way when we do that same thing or lose our way when we take a go-it-alone go approach to life. In fact, you know what? I think what Jesus is saying here, in the largest sense of things, is that God is not a cosmic scorekeeper who's tallying up our moral hits and misses. When he flips the status of the uh, prostitutes and tax collectors with that of the Pharisees, I think he's saying that We don't have to earn God's love. We don't have to earn God's love because here's an idea. God loves us even when we fail. Now that may sound like a simplistic idea, but to people who structure their lives around competition and getting ahead at any cost, that idea can shake your very soul. By flipping the Pharisees and the prostitutes, uh, uh, the Pharisees and the prostitutes and tax collectors, Jesus' point is unmistakable here. 
God's arms are open to everybody. Everybody, from every race, from every culture, every walk of life, every circumstance. And he says all of this with such force because he wants all of us to know that we're really missing out on something extraordinary when we put boundaries on God's grace. In the Pharisees' minds, God only had regard for that which was perfect or unblemished or without defect. They reduced God to the level of human beings who welcome only their own kind and reject that which is different. The Pharisees, for Jesus and his followers, had a very different understanding of God's grace, God's love for all of God's children, even those who had lost their way. For them, the the Pharisees were badgering and pressuring and looking for ways that people would come up short. Jesus knew that was not the way to bring hurting people into the realm of God. His approach was the opposite. He did it with love. He did it with acceptance. He did it by living out God's amazing, startling, absurd grace. And here's the thing. We're all filled with that grace. And our calling, then, is to reflect that grace to the world. Our calling is to to reach out to the kids who don't fit in or the older folks who feel like they've been forgotten and reflect that grace. We're to value all people as worthy of acceptance. And we're to introduce them to the one who says it's okay to be who you are because you're God made. And God doesn't make mistakes. And God has packed a whole lot more into you than you realize. And the joy of our faith is to unpack the gifts that God has placed within you. That's why Jesus comes on so strong here in this passage. Because people need to know. People need to know that nobody is helpless or hopeless. Nobody is beyond help. Nobody is overlooked. Nobody is discounted. Nobody's left out. Nobody is excluded from the realm of God. Nobody. Nobody. And that includes, yes, the Pharisees. Because he said the tax collectors and prostitutes would enter the kingdom of God before them. Why? Because the the tax collectors and prostitutes did not carry the baggage of religiosity. That's the irony. All they knew was that they were forgiven and welcomed. Jesus is simply uh, widening the boundaries of the realm of God. Of course the Pharisees are part of it, but so were the people that the Pharisees would never accept as equals. The Pharisees wanted a kingdom that was reserved for only themselves and those who were like them, thought like them, behaved like them. Jesus wanted a kingdom that was big enough for everybody. Remember Jesus' catchphrase? The kingdom of God is at hand. The realm of God is at hand. But what is that kingdom? What is that realm of God that is at hand? What does it look like? What is this Christian faith that everyone is battling to define these days? It's simply this, an inclusive community of people who are seeking God and trying to build a better world. An inclusive community of people who are seeking God and trying to build a better world. And most of the people in that community, they're not hyper-religious. They're people who have been not been all that they might have been or should have been, but somewhere along the way, in spite of everything, they've discovered that they're loved. And they want others to know that they're loved too. And that they belong. That's it. That's it. Unless you think that that sounds a little too soft and fuzzy, know this. Nothing can stop the forward momentum of this realm of God, this community of Christ. Nothing. Not even a sealed tomb can prevail against it. It will change lives, and it will change this world for the better. And you and I, we've got a front row invitation to be part of it. So let's go. Let's set aside our hesitations and truly 
embrace this new vision from Christ of the realm of God that's hallmarked not just by who's included, but also hallmarked by what it lacks. It lacks judgmentalism and hatred. It lacks narcissism and bullying. It lacks, lacks twisting lies into substitute truths. It lacks any demarcation that, or boundary that may separate us from one another as children of God. That's the realm of God. That's the vision that is ours to embrace. That's the vision that is ours to proclaim. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that through Jesus Christ, you have widened the welcome of your embrace to include everyone, even us, and even those we might prefer to exclude. We thank you that you accept us and love us even when we stumble and come up short. We ask you to continue to bless First Congregational Church as a place where we can answer your call, your call to share this great good news with one another and with the wider world so that all may know that a better world is possible. In the name of our resurrected Christ, we pray. Amen.